Hey everybody, I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust, and I'm standing on the first day's battlefield here at Gettysburg. Now, uh, where we are is actually up on McPherson's Ridge. It's named after the McPherson Farm. You might be able to see the barn over top of my shoulder there. McPherson Barn is from the American Civil War. That is a wartime structure. The rest of the farm will burn about 1895, but that barn will be used uh, as a hospital during the Battle of Gettysburg. Over um, to my left, over top of my left shoulder, uh, you're going to be looking out towards Hare's or Hur's Ridge. That is where the Confederates will advance towards Gettysburg. The Union Army is coming back uh, over uh, from the back from where this is being shot. So we'll have the Union First Army Corps commanded by a guy named John Reynolds coming up onto this area. Though technically it's commanded by a guy named Abner Doubleday. Because there's this crazy chain of command we'll talk about here in a second for the Union here on July 1st. But also up here on July 1st would be uh, cavalrymen. These would be horsemen, troopers of John Buford command and you might see John Buford standing back there in his 1895 statue made by James Kelly and some said this was the best likeness of John Buford anywhere even though he is not on horseback and then around John Buford you might see a few a uh, few cannon and the first shot to fire a cannon in a cannonball in anger towards the Confederates cannon number 233 is actually right at his feet uh, you can go over there and visit that that cannon uh, but we're up here on on McPherson Ridge really to talk about the man who's up on top the horse. This monument was placed here in August of 1899 and it is to the first corps commander uh, John Fulton Reynolds, a Lancaster, Pennsylvania native and he's a West Point graduate of the class of 1841. Reynolds, uh, when he comes here to Gettysburg, was in charge of the First Corps, but then there's a shakeup in the chain of command. A guy named George Gordon Meade will take over the Union Army on June 28th, and Meade is going to turn to Reynolds and give him one-third of the Army. He is going to make Reynolds a wing commander. He's going to be in charge of the First, the Third, and the Eleventh Corps, about 33,000 men, and then about 2,500 more troopers under John Buford. So John, Bu John Reynolds, when he comes here to Gettysburg, is not only a key commander, for the Union Army, he's not the first corps commander technically. He's a left wing commander in command of nearly one third of all the infantry that will fight here at Gettysburg. And I'm going to invite Dan Davis to come on here. Dan, why don't you talk just for a minute about who John Buford is and why he's important to the battle up here. John Buford is important to the battle because he recognizes the importance of the town of Gettysburg with the 10 roads, I believe, that Gary had mentioned earlier, running into the town, out of the town critical crossroads and he also recognizes the train south of town is going to be uh, very important for the def uh, whoever the whichever army occupies Gettysburg first so on the morning of July the 1st 157 years ago Buford's gonna fight a covering force action uh, along the ridges w north and west of town delaying AP e. Hill's third Corps buying enough time for John B Reynolds and the w and his wing to arrive on the field and essentially relieve Buford now Chris talked a little bit about uh, Buford, the Buford Monument behind me. It was actually dedicated on the 33rd anniversary of the battle, July 1st, 1896. And if you take a look at those folks who are in attendance at that dedication, for the you cavalry fans out there, it's a number of people that you will uh, definitely recognize. James Wilson, Wesley Merritt, uh, Theophilus Rodenbaugh, just to name a few. And as uh, Chris also mentioned, the tubes at the base of the monument, uh, one of the tubes did fire the first shot in the battle, fired by a Union gun but the all four of those tubes were used by battery a second u.s artillery commanded by john caleb who was attached to buford's division and one of those tubes has a plaque on it that marks that it was the uh, tube that fired the opening shot of the battle of gettysburg and just behind me over my right shoulder you'll see two other cannons and uh, roughly in that area between the buford monument and the reynolds monument to my right was where one of the sections of caleb's guns set up on the morning of july the 1st 1863. chris and, and let me just say for chris real quick uh, 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 gary edelman behind the camera if i were to go back about 60 yards i'd be in the railroad cut i would fall right into it but we're facing the other way and we're talking about reynolds here just straight up chris you know what was reynolds experience like and you know is he the godson everybody talks about. So John Reynolds is the highest ranking officer to fall here at the Battle of Gettysburg. He's killed on July 1st, shot through the head just south of us in the uh, Herbst Woodlot, uh, which you might be able to see right behind his monument. Now Reynolds uh, is a West Point graduate of the class of 1841, and a lot of people think uh, highly of John Reynolds. Professional soldier all his life, artillerist, knows what he's doing with artillery. When the American Civil War starts, he is going to rise quickly in the ranks uh, and who will eventually become the, the military governor of Fredericksburg, Virginia, then fight on the peninsula where he uh, 
ingloriously is going to be captured while sleeping by one of his West Point classmates, Daniel Harvey Hill. Some people argue that Reynolds was not sleeping. Sorry, folks, he was asleep. Reynolds will then uh, actually will be then uh, released from Confederate custody because the people of Fredericksburg thought so highly of John Reynolds, they actually are going to petition for his release from the Confederates. Uh, Reynolds will go on to fight at the Second Battle of Manassas, where he's a division commander, uh, commanding the Pennsylvania Reserves. He does very well there. But he's going to start a habit uh, at Second Manassas that will show not only at Second Manassas, but at Fredericksburg, and then over at or here at Gettysburg. What will end up happening is Reynolds will always be a division commander uh, at Second Manassas, but then he'll he'll demote himself on the field and fight right alongside the men, almost as a regimental commander or sometimes as a brigade commander at Fredericksburg. He will be in command of the First Corps there. And he will almost demote himself by going down the gun line, the artillery line. And he's going to tell the artillerists what to fire at, what their ranges will be. He is not acting as a corps commander. He's acting as a major of artillery. Then when he comes up here to Gettysburg, he's the left wing commander. He's going to ride forward into the woods but behind me where he is going to act as a brigade or regimental commander, admonishing his men to go forward when he is shot in the head. This was no place for the left wing commander. He was far too valuable uh, to be on this field. And, and just to give you an idea of what will end up happening is John Buford is so shaken by the closest next two Union generals, a guy named Dan Sickles, the third corps commander, and Oliver Otis Howard, the 11th corps commander, known as Uh-O Howard. That's not a good thing to be known as Uh-O Howard. <laughs> Buford is going to call back to Army headquarters and say, for God's sake, send us Hancock. And who he's referring to is Winfield Scott Hancock, the second corps commander. While Buford had a lot of faith in John Reynolds, John Reynolds was this guy who seemed to have done a lot of things. He was in a number of battles, but he never does anything that is so great and glorious, like George Gordon Meade winning the Battle of Gettysburg here, or Robert E. Lee turning the tide of the Peninsula Campaign, or the Seven Days Battles in 1862. John Reynolds is this guy who a lot of people look up to, but I don't think it's always uh, the, the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze with him, as I like to say. He's a guy who was a good or solid general, but I don't think he was a great general. He is not also the highest ranking officer killed in the Civil War. A lot of people think that they come here to Gettysburg. That will go to John Sedgwick, the Union 6th Army Corps commander, killed May 9th, 1864 at the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. The next ranking commander in that line killed in action will be James McPherson, who's killed outside of Atlanta in 1864. John Reynolds is the third highest ranking Union officer killed in action uh, in the American Civil War, but he's the highest ranking officer to fall here on the fields of Gettysburg. All right, well, two things. I'm going to turn it over to Dan in a quick second here. But first off, uh, you know, Chris is stirring up a hornet's nest. You're going to get these Nathaniel Lyon fans saying, oh, no way, he commanded a whole army. So, oh, man, uh, we got some danger coming in. I, I think Chris covered that well. But, Dan, just straight up, who would you rather have commanding a wing or a corps in your army, Reynolds or Hancock? Definitely Winfield Scott Hancock. But I will say, however, that Gettysburg is Winfield Scott Hancock's high tide. He's wounded on July 3rd in the, at the climax of Pickett's Charge. I don't think he ever fully recovers from that wound. He he comes back too early, and the, uh, the the intensity of the Overland Campaign of 1864 takes its toll on Hancock. He ends up ultimately going back home on leave, taking a leave of absence, never to return to the Army of the Potomac late in the fall of 1864. Winfield Scott Hancock's greatest battle probably here at Gettysburg, and it's a very appropriate end, to, per se, to the best part of his career. All right, good. My last thing I want to say, and I'll uh, close it out with Chris, is that Reynolds is... Uh, you know, sort of the second commander of the troops on the field here at Gettysburg. Since we're talking about the first day, it's John Buford, then it's John Reynolds, and then Reynolds is killed. So you got Doubleday in command, then Howard shows up, then he's in command. There are six different commanders of the Union Army on the field on July 1st alone. Chris, anything else to add? Yeah, just to close out John Reynolds. John Reynolds, um, he is going to be killed in action here, as we said. His body is going to be taken off the field into the town to the George George House. No, I am not stuttering. It is named George George, <laughs> kind of like Ricky Bobby. Uh, he has two first names. He he is going to be taken there, placed in a box that is too small for his body. Uh, they'll kick out the, the end of the box. His feet will actually hang out. He'll have to be taken to get to Lancaster, which is 55 miles in that direction. He's going to have to be taken down to Westminster, uh, Maryland, then over to Baltimore, where he's embalmed, eventually up to Philadelphia, and then his body will make his way to Lancaster on July 4th, 1863, the day after this battle closes. John Reynolds, one of the men who initiated the battle and really set the Union up for victory here, so I guess he couldn't be all bad. Reynolds is going to be buried there. It's going to take 
his body 255 miles to actually travel the 55 miles to Lancaster, where he is uh, buried in the Lancaster Cemetery. And you can visit his grave today. Oh man, in five.